everybody. Welcome back to the Listen For Real podcast. I'm Jennifer Brown and I am so, so happy you are here and we have a great conversation ahead. Every time I talk with this man, I go, why are we not recording? (laughs) We are with Sean Smith, also known as Coach Sean Smith, also known as I mean, so many things. I'm going to have him actually tell a little story about himself and give a little bit of his bio, but we are going to talk many things. Sean has opened my mind to all things race, identity, um, white privilege. He's awakened me to many, many things. And there's a lot of ways we're similar, but there are many ways we're different. And my goal in talking today and in all of these conversations, as you know, is I already know what I know and it's limited. I have got to talk to other people who have a different lived experience than I do and who have a perspective that will broaden my own. And every time I talk to Sean or listen to him or listen to his work, which I can't wait for you all to be exposed to that, I am grown and I get paradigms that grow and God willing shift. Mm -hmm. And so I just, Sean, I'm so happy you're here. Welcome. And thank you for just taking the time. I know you run uh, a mad dog kind of schedule. You have a lot of projects going on, Mm -hmm. but I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for the invite. I'm getting goosebumps just hearing you talk about not just this podcast, but your openness to people with different lived experiences. Yeah. We got to dive in on that. Yeah, we will. I, the reason or the way we met is I actually met Sean because he is a TEDx speaker and a spoken word poet. And he created y'all the most amazing, and it's one of several he has done, amazing, I guess you would call it spoken word poetry Mm. and TEDx talk all wrapped up into one. And it was on a uh, racism. And actually we can give the title because it's going to be viral very shortly <laughs> and found. Um, and it's called Dear Racism, a breakup letter by a, wait, a break, Dear Racism, a breakup letter from a white man, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you want to just talk a little bit about what led to that really quick and what, what caused you to decide on that and, and say, yeah, I actually want to make this into a TEDx talk. We want to talk about that first because that's how we met and then we'll launch into a whole lot of other good stuff. Yeah, sure. And it is neat to think about the connection that you and I now have and the experiences that we have. And it just came about because I applied for a TEDx Folsom, you know, yeah, and then connected with you. And we had a, a pretty epic conversation the first time we talked. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something around the, the original thought for the talk, which I think is, is how I pitched it to you guys in the very beginning, was the difference in our society. And, and I've kind of coined this term differencism because I think underneath all of our isms, is the fear of difference. Race is one of the differences and different genders and lifestyles, homosexuality, transphobia, uh, different social classes, you know, all the isms and all the divisive prejudices, I believe stem from a fear of people who are different than us which actually has a neurological origin for humans because we have to be afraid of anything different in order to stay alive. At least we have to be skeptical of it, right? So our brain wants us to stay alive and our brain is constantly seeking things that we understand, things that we're familiar with, because if we're familiar with something, then it probably won't kill us. You know, we, we understand the danger inside of our familiarities. So anything that's different than us, we tend to fear partly at a deep neurological level, but then mostly, I think, from a behavioral standpoint, according to our programming, we're told who's different than us and who are the bad guys and who we need to watch out for. And we get all kinds of evidence as we live our lives. 
And then it starts to get cemented into these different prejudices that we have. So I wanted to do a talk on differencism, but especially with the theme of the event being reimagined, I really loved the idea of reimagining racism. And I'm very passionate about speaking on racism. And so if you remember the first couple of times that I even talked about what my my topic was going to be, you know, I didn't even know. I didn't have anything fully written and we just kind of got into some discussions and something didn't land well. And that's pretty strange for me that I create something, share it with somebody and walk away with more uncertainty. Like, nah, that just didn't feel real. You know, usually it, it just kind of starts to come together as I talk it out with other people, but this was the opposite. And so I walked away just going, all right, well, we're just gonna have to scrap this, but I don't know what I'm going to do now. And I was, I think laying in bed and I was just awakened by this thought and I don't know what triggered it. It was just one of those divine downloads of dear racism, a breakup letter from a white man. And I just immediately jumped out of bed, you know, Uh like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is, and I, and my heart started pounding and then I started writing and then started talking about it. And then it, it, it just came together. And I first wrote the letter to racism. But then as I formed the talk, you know, I, I wanted to give it a little bit more context and tell the story of how I got there. And then it evolved into you know, what it ended up being, which is a, a collection of three different poems, as well as three distinctions speaking about, you know, my journey through this and you were really instrumental in the way it evolved. And so I really appreciate your, your place that you played in it. Uh, But it felt sacred, Jen, like I've had that feeling a few different times where something just felt sacred. Like, like the thought was given to me, not for it to stay in my head, but to get it out as fast as possible. And what was interesting about that is it didn't really feel like my work. It felt like I was immediately just the messenger for this thing that found its way in my head. And I've heard it said that we get these sacred ideas and if we don't implement them, they're going to show up in somebody else's head some point in the near future, right? So you might as well get it out. (laughs) You know, Paulo, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, The Alchemist by Paulo. I just read it. For the first time this last weekend. Okay. Do you know that yes. he wrote that in two weeks, dude? Really? Two I didn't weeks, know that. And I heard him interviewed and he talked about the fact that that's exactly what that was. It was something just, he could never um, repeat it there. It, it, um, he, the, he was being asked, once you have something like that, how do you ever top it. And he goes, I could never top that because that was uh, out of body almost in the way that came to me. Yeah, It was downloaded through me. I wrote it in two weeks. I could never create something like that again. And that is exactly how he described it. And then I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert and Big Magic, her book, she talks about creativity. And that is her exact concept is that the idea comes to you And it is that important for the universe, whatever your beliefs are, whether it's God, source, universe, whatever. I choose to call my high power God, but it it is coming to you and it is there for a purpose. And if you don't um, operate with it at that point, it's going to it's like the idea makes its way to the next vehicle that's going to make it come to fruition. And that's, then I don't know if I articulated that well, but that's, I, I uh. think you did perfect. Yeah. And I believe all of that. And this could be a whole nother podcast episode right. about creativity because I've learned so much to, to everything that you're saying about what creativity actually looks like and feels like, and most people do misunderstand it. And I think if that kind of divine download, I call it a sacred message shows up on your doorstep and you don't open the door, the chances that it'll show up again decrease. That's right. And so we've got to get this sacred messaging out of us. And it needs to, I always say your message needs oxygen to evolve. It needs to come out. People need to hear it. They need to give you feedback. You need to hear it. You know, we hear our message differently through our ears after it comes out of our mouth verbally than we do in our head 
as we're just listening to it echo around in our head, we don't hear it the same as when we actually speak it out loud and then our ears hear it from our mouth. It's all part of the creative process and most people are, are, are scared of it actually. Well, it's a super vulnerable thing. And I was just thinking about let's grow. So y'all, you need to Google let's grow because this is a short film that Sean did with Lisa Nichols and please tell me his name. David so, Bianchi. David Bianchi. Totally. Um, and it's like 16 minutes, right? 16 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Was this one of those downloads? Cause I, you, that immediately came to mind the incredible messaging within it. And, um, the, the, just, just the beauty within it too. And it's simplicity that it didn't need two hours. And in fact, two hours would have done something to that message. There was something about it being kept short. So how, yeah. is that one of those situations? Like, how did that affect you? And let's, let's expand on that. Cause yeah. Is, thank you for mentioning it. it yeah. It's uh, it. It's one of the things that I'm most proud of creating and being a part of. And the short answer is no, it was not this sacred, divine creation experience at all. One of the reasons, I mean, the, the coming together of the three of us, you know, Lisa and I wanted to do something across cultural lines and we've forged a, a really tight friendship, but we didn't really know what it was going to look like. You know, we figured we'd jump on Zoom and have a conversation about something. And when George Floyd was murdered, we knew it had to be now mm -hmm. you know, it was just calling and, and we both have been in the public space in terms of building our businesses. And, you know, we're both into coaching and speaker training and personal development, but neither of us have been public with anything uh, in around racism. We just haven't been public with any of that stuff. So we both felt a calling that once the world swelled into this conversation about racism and systemic uh, oppression and white privilege and all the stuff that was so in our face, we couldn't ignore it. Then Lisa and I had an urgency to, to get it done. And she ended up crossing paths with David, I believe at Agape Church down here in Southern California with Dr. Beckwith. And they were both just sharing, you know, I've been thinking about doing something and David's like, this is what I do. And so David is a Hollywood actor and he has a Hollywood set and crew. And so he is what made the project, the Hollywood production that it is. But what made it a little clunky is that the three of us were co-creating a poetic story. And that's not easy to do. And, it, you know, anybody that's written poetry, just poetry itself, you know, you got to kind of get into a flow for it to come out. But then for, for me to write my poem and then David to write his and Lisa to write hers, and then we bring them together and realize they're not even touching each other. Then we have to make, you know, we're, we're handing off the baton basically, because as you know, you've seen the movie, you know, I speak and David speaks and I speak and David speaks and Lisa speaks and David speaks and I speak, you know, so it's not just three poems back to back it's all interwoven and my character is the white man and you know talking through what i believe to be ignorance and white privilege and a lot of the the angers that represent the white community and david as the black man is speaking back from his perspective and lisa is giving this like sacred motherly higher wisdom perspective so to get them to all come together was actually quite difficult and it took a lot of writing and rewriting and rewriting and uh, but it was we were pulled from this divine place so if the mission wasn't as sacred as it was we may have never even finished like if if we would have just come together and said hey let's create a poem together just for artistic purposes or entertainment we we might not even finish that poem but because we knew this is so important, let's stay at the table and talk and, and get this right. Uh, that, that's, that gave us the urgency to, and what the world was doing at the time to make it happen. And then we met 
uh, in a single day and filmed it all out in Los Angeles. And that was, it was all just a, in an incredible day? project. Yeah, it was all one day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was really, really neat. And I'd never been on a Hollywood set like this and, f and seen all the different scenes, you know, because you don't film the scenes in order. Right. You film the scenes according to what's on set and who's going to be on set, you know? And yeah. so it was really cool to see how it's all done. And, and you, we, we have a Hollywood director. There's like 30, 30 plus Hollywood people that worked on that film. Yeah. I mean, it is full blown Hollywood production. It's just only 16 minutes, right? But we could have yeah. had the same crew created a, a, you know, an hour and a half or two hour film. Uh, so it, it, it's something that we're extremely, extremely proud of. And to your point, it would be tough to sit in the intensity of that conversation for a couple hours. Yeah. But it's, it's a hard punching film and it's confrontational, not in an abrasive way, but in an invitational way. But the topic itself is tough. And yeah. we, you know, we're dealing with ignorance from both sides of the table. Yeah. And so the whole story that's told, which is essentially I as a white man and David as a black man, you know, we are adversaries until we literally sit down at the table and look each other in our eyes and then we can see ourselves in each other. And that's what's not happening in most of these divisive conversations, race just being one of them. We're not seeing ourselves in each other, which goes back to what I was saying about differencism. You know, anything that's different is dangerous and anything that is same is safe. Yeah. So we seek safety and sameness and we fear danger and difference, which is why I loved what you said earlier about appreciating other people's lived experiences. And if we were to operate that way, you know, in, in the context of the movie, here's David, a black man telling me about racism. And I, as a white man at the beginning was denying all of it because I never experienced it. And so now I'm in this extremely arrogant situation of arguing over who's right and who's wrong instead of just going, well, what if you have a different lived experience than me? And what if I can learn from it rather than be afraid of it? And then what if we can walk away as partners rather than adversaries. Yep. And when it comes to racism, especially, I think what's so critical for us to get is this isn't an us versus them mm -hmm. conversation. It can't be if we're ever going to have any progress. It has to be an us versus it. Yeah, I love that. We have to come together and recognize there's an entity here that's actually much bigger and much more powerful than any of us individually. So let's identify what that is and come together to fight against it. I think that's the only way that we're going to have progress inside this racism discussion. Yeah. Will you tell a bit about your own awakening? When did you become aware of the water you were swimming in to, co to coin, I think, your own phraseology? When did you become even aware of your own racism and accept it? And, and there are many who are probably listening right now. I would have told you this a number of years ago that I'm not a racist. Mm -hmm. um, I love people of color. I love people of, of different backgrounds. And um, I, I wouldn't behave uh, in any way race, racist, um, but I can tell you, because we swim in the water, mm. that is a culture that unfortunately is, um, I, and I heart still struggle to put the words in because this is such a new vernacular even for me, but we swim in this water that can't help but give us a bias. And so I can think I'm not racist all I want. And I may not do overt racist things like attend a rally or become a white supremacist or, but that doesn't mean I don't need to root out and flesh. And in fact, if anything, because it's not overt, I wonder if it's a little more insidious and dangerous because I sit back and just go, Oh, I'm good. Right. So 
Yeah. I know I've struggled with this and I'm still trying to reconcile it and understand it and just have more conversations to wake up a little more around it. But what, what about you? Like, how has this been a journey for you? And talk about your story a little bit, because I think our, our stories are huge. Yeah. Thank you for all of that. And you mentioned multiple things that are so important to understand and dissect. The analogy that you're referring to is from a conversation I was in with a friend of mine, a a black woman, and we were talking about race. And she said, saying you're, you live in America and you're not racist is like saying you're in a swimming pool, but you're not wet. Y'all just hang on because some of you are bristling right now. (laughs) I get it. I want you to just hang on and just take a deep breath and listen without defenses going up because that's what we do because I just, I know me. So yeah, I'm really glad that you said that. Yeah. And I think it was important for that to come out of a black woman's mouth because she said, I'm racist too. Hmm. And that doesn't make sense to, I'll just speak for my own experience inside the white community. That doesn't make sense for us. The way that we hold on to the definition of racism, which you alluded to, you know, I've never been to a KKK rally. I don't hate black people. You know, I, I want them to do well. So therefore I'm not racist. We have a, an extremely myopic and surface level definition of racism. And we obviously don't want to be lumped in with racists. So we don't want to be the the bad guy in the story, which I want to get to in a moment. But back to the swimming pool analogy, she said, everybody in the pool is wet because the racism is in the water. And it's none of our individual faults. I think that's a key distinction, especially as you just highlighted, you know, people start to bristle a little bit. When we do that, when our defense mechanisms get raised, it's because we are trying to defend our identity. We're trying to defend that we're still a good person. We're trying to defend against the perceived attack that if we're racist, then we're intentionally racist or we're just a bad person or, you know, something that feels like a personal attack. That's why we get defensive. So her analogy was really helpful for me to go, we're in different places of the pool, but we're in the same pool. So the problem is in the water, not in the individual people in the water. And that water has soaked into us in different ways for different reasons, but the problem is the water. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't want to defend against that. You know, people that see themselves as extremely patriotic or they identify as an American or a patriot or something like that, you know, they a lot of times don't like any negative light being shined on the country or the origins of the country or slavery or how brutal this society started. Mm-hmm. which are all undeniable, but people just don't like talking about it or they don't, they don't like to, that to be exposed. But if we recognize this is a bigger entity, which is us versus it, it's all the people versus the pool rather than people versus people in the pool. Yes. And that will help detach us from the need to defend. And I think we can be not racist and racist at the same time. And what I mean by that, and then I'm going to get to the story that I'm kind of going in in reverse order here. What I mean by that is in the white community, this is just my philosophy, in the white community, I think racist is a noun. So you are a racist or you are not a racist. It's just an either or. and, And essentially it's you're good or you're bad right? Because if you are a racist, you're a bad person. I think we have this shared agreement that racist people, i.e. the people in the hoods, burning crosses, lynching people who are viciously hateful toward 
black people, minorities, non-white, women, gay, whatever, those are bad people. Like we have a shared agreement on the definition that people who are overtly hateful are bad people. So that becomes our definition. If we're not that, then we're not racist as a noun. But we can be a not racist as a noun, but still be racist as an adjective. Because racism is the influence. So a system can be racist. Language can be racist. A word can be racist. If we start using racist only as an adjective to describe the influence, rather than trying to pick and choose who are the racist people, then we can have more of a progressive conversation. Because as long as it's racist or not as a noun, as a person, it's an us, this is an us versus them conversation. Yep. And then the white people are going to be trying to highlight who in the white community are the enemies, who are the bad people in the community, right? And a lot of times we try to do that to, uh, to claim our social righteousness, I guess, right? Like if I can, I, if I can expose the white racists, then, then I'm a really good white person. Not, most <laughs> of this is not conscious, but this is just, you know, like some of our programming. Yeah. So, <laughs> excuse me, those two concepts are, are really critical. How I got here, I very clearly remember the moment I was in an airport in New York and I was on the phone with a man that I grew up with. We grew up same age. He's now a man, you know, because we're the same age, but we grew up together as boys playing baseball and, and going to school together. And he's a black man. And he and I have a, a real tight relationship that allows us to get into some pretty divisive topics and it's not going to end the friendship, but because we're so tight, you know, almost like, like brothers, we can, we can get after it a little bit, right? It can get heated. Love it. And so I was yelling at him this day because we were talking about racism and he was telling me I was racist and he was telling me that America is racist and he was talking about all the systemic oppression. And I just had enough of that that day. And, and I was yelling back at him in defense of it. And then I used one of the, the tools of the trade, which is shame. And I tried to shame him. Like, how dare you call me a racist? You know who I am. How dare you make that accusation? Which was all my, my defensiveness. But I went after him with, with somewhat of a shameful attack because I hoped, you know, that that would work and he would, he would uh, retreat you know, with his accusation, but he didn't. And what he did instead was he got really calm. He didn't yell back at me. He got really calm. And he said, of course, Sean, I mean, we grew up together, went to school together, played baseball together, slept over. Like we, I know you, I know your mom. I know your dad. I know your, I know your family. I know you. you're not consciously racist. However, Sean, you've been produced by a racist machine and it benefits you more than it does me. And Jen, I just, I stopped yelling. I stopped breathing. It was such a short circuiting comment because he removed me from the target, everything that we've been talking about. It wasn't me being a bad racist, but he gave me a picture of this machine. This is a racist machine that produced both of us, but the way it produced me, my experiences on the planet, because of my skin color, we've had much different lived experiences by the same machine. And I can remember so clearly not knowing how big that distinction was going to be, but recognizing on some level, my life just changed. 
You know, like it was that big. It was like a seismic moment for me. And my body changed is like all the energy just, just kind of just, just went away. I, I wasn't angry at him. And I was actually drawn into more of the conversation. And I said, tell me more. Right. So I was intrigued and I wanted to hear more about this thing because he was telling a story where I wasn't the bad guy, but we just had different experiences. And then he told me several stories about his life as a black man, all things that I didn't recognize because I didn't see it. I wasn't on that end of racism. So it's easy for me as a white man to go, I've never seen any cops beat up a black person. Well, why would I? Right? This is way back before social media and cameras and all that stuff. So my perspective was, if I haven't seen it, it doesn't exist. And here you're trying to tell me something that exists that I have evidence doesn't exist. But him telling me this story about the machine and then saying, for example, this, and for example, this, and for example, this, I couldn't deny any of it. And it was something so extremely powerful that I was actually, it, it was like I shifted teams, you know, it was like I, I made the shift from us versus them to us versus it. And then I was like, all right, I got to learn about this machine. And I'm interested in how the machine produced him and anybody that doesn't have the same life as me. And it changed my defensiveness to curiosity. Yeah. And that was probably eight or nine years ago. And it's been a journey ever since. Like this is not a flip of a switch. And I think one of the things that we all need to understand with a topic like this is when you get into it, my experience has been this. Once I start leaning into my ignorance, you know, I start exploring what white privilege is and, and what do I see that I didn't see before? And what are some of the things that I just didn't know about the history of this country or, or racism around the globe? There's so much that I don't know. And the more that I start to learn about what I don't know, the more I recognize how much more I don't know. Mm. It, this is not a journey of answering questions as much as it's a journey of opening questions. And I think that's really important for us as a society, whether it's in a single relationship with one other person, or if it's in a family dynamic, or if it's cross-cultural or any other larger groups, I think it's really important that we recognize we're not going to come together and find answers in an hour long conversation or a day long conversation or a year. You know, we're talking about things that are so deep and things that have been so hidden. And you said something earlier that I think is really critical also. The racism that's not overt is actually the more dangerous racism. And racism is designed at a systemic level, it's designed to protect itself. It's designed to make white people convinced that we're not racist, which is why this whole breakup letter was so uh, su such a, a sacred shift for me. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, if you remember, like part of the, uh, the, the first line is you've lied to me. Yeah. And you've been using me as a puppet this whole time. And I defended you. Right. You got me to defend you because I was convinced that if racism existed, then I needed to be a racist person and I and I'm a bad guy and I'm not willing to do that. So I'm going to defend. And so it really, truly I'm going to use a word that might make no sense in, in this context, but there's a brilliance inside of racism of the influence of racism. It's actually brilliantly designed to protect itself. Yep. Yep. I was just thinking that it, it, it's a, it reminds me of my daughter 
stay with me a minute, but my daughter had Lyme disease. And the way you fight Lyme disease is it hides in your tissues and then it morphs and then it changes and it's subtle and it's insidious and you hit it with one antibiotic and then it quickly changes. It's that genius. Wow. And then it changes form and it looks different and you got to hit it with another antibiotic. I think racism is the same thing. Same way. And and it is the insidiousness of, of it being non-overt that makes it still easily palatable and it has staying power that way. You know what I'm saying? A hundred percent. Yeah, no, and, totally. And as long as we on the ground, the, the puppets of the racism, the, the, the people that are wet in the pool, as long as we're bickering with each other, nothing's happening to the actual power and influence of the entity itself because the puppets are fighting each other. So nobody's really looking at the influence over the puppets. And I don't mean to sound demeaning in this because some people might take that as like, you know, we're, we're all, I mean, even the word puppet is pretty demeaning and I don't mean it that way. Uh, it, it's, it's just that there's something much bigger than us. So what I've found is I actually feel bigger in my ability to talk about the conversation and the challenges and be an, an influencer in some way, open up these conversations. I actually feel bigger in my ability to do that when I realize how small I am in the entity. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like this counter intellectual thing. The more I realize that it has influence over me, that's what gives me influence back over it. And it's because of the detachment and, and us getting rid of our need to defend ourselves inside of the conversation. We'll never really have a clean conversation when we're trying to defend our identity in the conversation, regardless of what it is. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what word has been coming to mind over and over as you've been talking? It's the word neutrality. Mm. And what I mean by that is there's something very powerful about having a conversation and being curious and not swinging to extremes, which many of us are prone to, but yeah. landing in this place of neutrality, which leads to an ability to hear better, to open our mind and our heart a little more. Does that, does that make sense? I love so it. I'm not fighting it. I'm not, um, because for me, I'm a person who swings from extremes. So the minute I think, oh my gosh, there could be a shred of racism in me. I now swing to this other extreme. I got to become this, that, and the other. And that isn't always helpful. And, and there, there just becomes this wide swing. And I think it's that settling in the middle, that neutrality I'm verbally processing as I talk about it because sometimes I think about, oh, lukewarm, you spit that out, neutral, just means you mm. don't take a stand. That's what I've always been taught. You take mm. a stand you, you, and then you go down fighting, right? <laughs> right. Well, that is the opposite of neutrality. That is an extreme. And so I always think in terms of extreme. Oh, okay. Um, I'm married. Everything's wonderful. Oh, the minute there's a problem in my marriage. Oh shit. I better get a divorce. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like, yeah. who does that? Okay. So back to what I do that. Talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm like that too. So we're from that same club. And so what I'm realizing is there's a beauty and a power in neutrality to keep, uh, I guess, to keep this conversation going. I don't know. It's just neutrality keeps popping in my mind as you're talking. Yeah, I love that word. And it's a detachment from our emotional identities. That's, yep. That allows us to have clean conversations. With racism, I, I love the word neutrality. With racism, we all need, no matter where we are in the conversation, and it, this is, you know, it's not just white versus black. Mm -hmm. You know, in America, we've obviously got the history of slavery, primarily black people. So it, it gets extremed, to your point, by us thinking that it's just white versus black. But it's, it's really not. It's, it's much, much deeper than that. So 
we all need to put down our weapons and drop our defenses to come together and actually connect as humans. And I think putting down the weapons and the defenses is what you're saying is neutrality. Like I'm, I'm getting a visual right now. You know, if we both had guns in our hand and we both wanted to say we're safe, we'd put the gun down and we'd show each other our palms and go, listen, I'm not, I'm not here to hurt you. Uh, I'm safe. And if we could all adopt that kind of vulnerable neutrality, then we can look at reality without us being attached to it. This is an extremely vulgar image and I don't, I've only shared this maybe once or twice and for whatever reason it's, it, it's in my head and on my heart to share it now. When it comes to slavery, I had this image, I don't know if it was while I was writing my part of Let's Grow, I think it probably was. I had this image, actually yeah it was because I almost wrote it into the poem but I ended up taking it out, of a lynching. And I saw the rope on the tree and there's a person holding the rope and, the, and then there's a person hanging from the rope. And I, and I don't mean to be, uh, you know, traumatic. Like one, one of the things, I'll pause here for a second. One of the things that I've learned in this whole conversation is that it's really easy for me and I think for most white people to talk about lynchings and hangings and a lot of the atrocities because we don't have embodied trauma around them because we weren't on the wrong side of them and our, our, our ancestors weren't the victims. And so one of the things that I've become sensitive to is how a lot of, and this is one of the things where I've only shared this twice, like this, this rope analogy. Um, a lot of the things that, that, that are easy for me to, to say and share, it exposes an embodied trauma, specifically in the black community when we're talking about slavery and, and some of the atrocities. And that's not fair. It, it's, it's not fair, nor is it productive to re-expose an embodied deep trauma. And sometimes the individual person doesn't know that they even have that embodied trauma. So I say all that because I've become a lot more sensitive to even just saying, you know, talking about some of the atrocities, you know, the, the, some of the lynchings and, and things like that. But just to complete the analogy, my ancestors were holding the rope, which puts us in a position of power. It puts us in a position of evil. It, it, it makes us the bad guy in that story very clearly. And so we don't want to even know about that story. That's why there's so much sensitivity and fragility in the white community, learning about some of the things that actually happened. You know, a lot of the stuff that never made it into our textbooks, but some of the things that actually happened, we don't want to know that because we know we're in the wrong part of that story. And that's why there's a lot of... Uh, pre-shame defense kind of like you're not going to shame me by saying oh all white people are racist right you're not going to tell me that i should be ashamed of my skin color i've never heard anybody who's not white say white people should be ashamed of their skin color i've never heard it said once ever i've never heard that position but that's the most common white people defense that white people use. Yeah. I'm not going to be ashamed for being white. It's like, nobody's saying that, but that's the way we feel, mm -hmm. which is really important to get. If we're defending against shame, 
that's actually not being attacked, then where's that shame coming from? Mm -hmm. And there is an embodied shame, I think, in the white culture because we don't want to have been the people holding the rope. And that's why so many people want to make sure that they don't have slave owners in their in, in their lineage, right? Like I that's was another just thinking that. I was right. Just thinking that. Yeah. Like the idea that I had a slave owner as one of my ancestors one of, is one of the worst things. So white people, it's like get out a racism free card, right? You yeah. pull the card out. Like I don't have any slave owners. Yep. So I, I can't be racist. Yep. And that just comes from this embodied shame of things that happen that are legitimately shameful. But we don't have to, nor is anybody asking us as descendants of even those exact people or just the white culture. Nobody's saying that we are guilty of those acts and therefore we should be ashamed of who we are, but we defend against being guilty because internally we, we feel that. I think there is an embodied guilt and shame in the white community that we want to try to avoid. But the easiest way to avoid it is don't tell those stories. If we don't talk about it, then we can avoid that guilt and shame. But don't you agree shame and guilt are not productive? Not at all. Accountability. Maybe that's what we strive for is lineage or no lineage. I am accountable because I'm a human being on a planet with other human beings. And this entity called racism is a problem. And so I am accountable as a human being on this planet because other people are suffering mightily as a result of racism. So maybe that's it is, is shame and guilt really need to be removed from the equation because they're half the problem. In fact, they're a tool of racism and, and they're, they render us impotent in a way to combat it. Does that? I completely agree. It, it shouldn't be used, which it is when we're searching out the individual racist people, Mm -hmm. there's guilt and shame built into that. Cause if you're a racist person, you are guilty and you should be shameful. So the guilt and shame is embedded in that. And I agree that whether it's white people trying to, out, you know, the other white racists, or it's non-white people calling white people racist and saying in, in some version, you know, whether explicitly or not, like you're the bad person, it's not productive. It, it's not false, but it's not productive. Meaning like one of the, I believe it's a truth. One of the, the big conversations is racism is a white problem, which I think it is because racism, oh, there's so much to talk about here. I know. You know, there's a difference between prejudice based on race and racism. So a black person can have prejudice against white people, but a black person cannot be racist systemically because the black culture doesn't have power in this country. So if we make a distinction that racism can only be top down from whoever has the power, then racism is only in one direction. There are black people who are prejudiced based on race and they might hate white people But that's not the same thing as systemic racism from top down. And I think that's a really important distinction. It's not an easy one to grasp, but it's a really important distinction because if we think prejudice based on race is the same as systemic racism, then we're going to be bickering over things that can't solve the problem. So going back to your point, identifying who's guilty and who should be shameful regardless of who's using that as a tool is not going to be productive because we will always protect against our feelings of guilt and shame. And that's why there's so much misdirection, right? If you're, if you're going somewhere that's going to make me feel guilty and shameful, I'm going to try to change the subject. Yep. And I might do it in a vicious manner, which is what we see a lot. You know, like the, the harsher I'm trying to, protect against my emotions, 
the harsher my defense against you will be. Like the, like the deeper my guilt and shame, the more aggressive I'll be outward to protect it. Does that make sense? Yep, that does. So going back to what you said about neutrality, if we could all just go, all right, this is the country we were brought up in. This is the swimming pool that we were born into. Let's look at what is in the fabric of our society. It's not my fault because I'm white and you're not a perpetual victim because you're black. Like we got to get away from these, these black and white. I mean, I, I mean, from a conceptual standpoint, not, not race, like it's either or thinking. We, we can't solve anything as complex as human behavior over the course of hundreds of years with either or thinking. I mean, it's just so juvenile to think that that's going to get us anywhere. So if we can come to that place of neutrality and say, this is what we're dealing with. This is the country that we live in. And I, you know, I only have the experience of living in America, but from what I know, racism works the same, you know, different details, but racism is racism, whether it's on a different continent or, or not, it essentially is going to work the same way. So if we can come to the table with neutrality, then we can drop our guard. And that's really the only way that we're going to see sameness in each other. I have a story I want to tell. I don't, don't, please, please help me remember to tell this story, but I want to okay. continue this, this final piece of this thought. What we as white people, I believe, really need to lean into if we want to be a part of the progressive solution is that we are ignorant about a lot of stuff and that we will be wrong about a lot of stuff. We have been wrong about a lot of stuff because of our programming, not because we're bad people, but because of our programming. Like who knew about Juneteenth, that the June 19th date is extremely significant in the black community. I didn't know about it till last year. Same. Why would I know about it? It's not in my history books. Like we can't go like none of us are going to be sitting around going, I wonder if there is like in a significant date where white people massacred a bunch of black people, but they didn't tell me about it. So let me go search on Google. Hey, is there anything that I'm not aware of? That's not the way our brain works. We don't actively look for things that we're not aware of, but we have to understand that in our experience, there are a lot of things that we are not aware of. And just because we're ignorant doesn't make us bad people. So if we as white people that want to be in this conversation can lean into the idea, and it's not easy and it's actually scary most of the time for most people, myself included, even though I've been talking about it for a couple of years now, my body still gets activated when I'm getting ready to talk about racism because my body's like, shut up, don't say this. This is uncomfortable. It's tender. Like, don't do it. So it's natural to have that resistance, but we need to lean into the idea that we are ignorant, that we will be wrong, that we, that we will feel wrong, and we might even feel shame. And that's part of the process. That, those are just in the cards that we were dealt. And our only two choices, if we want to be active in this conversation at all, is to try to skip over all of that and get right to Martin Luther King's speech of I have a dream where we don't see color and you know we, we judge each other by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. We as a white community would love to just get there. Like, can we just skip over all the messy stuff and just get there? Oh my gosh, there? I've done that. I've done that. I've made the Facebook post and I thought, okay, there it is. I'm good. I'm, it's like a little, like a, a golden ticket. That just right. proved it. Right. And it's, and it's so much more about the conversation, not throwing out the pithy saying or liking the right social media post and sharing it. Bingo. And, yeah. and it's in our nature and our programming to do that because I've done the same thing. Yeah. And especially it's like, hey, a black guy said this. So if a black guy said it and I'm supporting what a black guy said, well, I'm clearly not racist. Right. But <laughs> yeah. we can't take a detour to get to that place. My spirit has to believe that that place is possible. Yeah. 
I'm positive that place is possible individually in an individual person. I'm positive that place is possible within a small group dynamic. I'm not positive that we'll ever get there in a grand society, but I'm positive that it's possible. So I have to believe that that's possible, but there's no shortcut there. And we have to go through recognition. Here's another quote that totally changed the way I think about all this stuff recently. A woman who's been in diversity and inclusion and equity conversation, you know, cultural training for 30 years. She said, we're all trying to get to reconciliation, but white people just try to jump to reconciliation to our point, what we just talked about. Black people are like, no, 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 no. You, you need to admit how bad slavery was. You need to admit how awful it's been to be a black person in America. You need to admit this and you need to admit that. Right. And that's why this, the two sides don't come together very often. And, and I'm not saying that either side, I don't mean to paint any side with an entire brush. So I'm not saying the entire black community thinks that, or the entire white community is trying to do the same thing. But if we look at the extremes, but what this woman said is we can never get to reconciliation without recognition. So if we're going to come together and go, yeah, we're both in the same swimming pool, we all need to recognize the pool. We all need to recognize the history of this country. We as white people need to recognize what privilege actually is. The best analogy for, to me for privilege came to me about a year ago when I was in this conversation on Facebook Live. And I recognized I was in my studio here and it was raining outside, but I was in the corner of my studio and I couldn't see the rain. And I just had this really clear awareness in the moment. If somebody were to ask me right now, if it's raining, my answer is no. My clothes are wet. I don't see any rain. It's not raining. When just outside the wall, if I was 30 feet in another direction, it would be pouring on me. So the distinction between existence and experience has been huge for me. Something can exist that I haven't experienced. That's right. But if we're just using whether we've experienced it or not, as the basis of a discussion or an argument of whether it exists or not, then we're not going to go anywhere. And, I, and, and that was in, in my TEDx talk where I'm inside the house, all nice and warm and cozy, and my friend Dominic is telling me that it's raining. And we can both be right. That's exactly it can be right. raining on him and not raining on me. Mm -hmm. He can experience systemic oppression, and I haven't. He can have seen racism and I haven't, but that requires us to take this worldview that two things can coexist at the same time, even if the experiences are completely different. And I think we can only get there through that word of yours, neutrality. But it's messy. As you were talking, I was Oof. thinking about, we have to be willing. I was thinking about me why do I shy away from a conversation? As you were talking, I thought, because I'm afraid to say something wrong. I'm Bingo. afraid to look stupid or uninformed or racist. I'm um, like when you mentioned, let's say a black person says, oh, we want you to understand this, to feel this pain, to really get the gravity of this. I don't think I ever could. I don't know yeah. what it's like. Mm -mm. I, I could try. I could watch tons of movies and have my heart stirred. I could read Ibram X. Kendi's book and a million other books and, 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 and try to understand. But there is no way I can ever understand what it is is or what it's like and so then i literally it's impossible it's yes. impossible it's impossible and um and so then i think about wanting to have these conversations and then what holds me back and it is it's saying something wrong or erroneous or offensive or stupid but i think we just need to get okay with it being yes. messy and ugly and then show each other grace. And then I try to give people around me freedom to go, Jen, hate to tell you this, but what you just said, you can't, no. Don't say you that. can't say that. You know <laughs> what I mean? 
Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for telling me. I, I literally, I don't even realize Absolutely. I'll say a phrase that I didn't know was highly offensive and inappropriate because it's in the water and I've heard it sent, you know, it's like Marco Polo in the water. Yes. Well, it, it, of course I just say it. Right. And Tell a lot of that is just yeah, simply on. our ignorance. You know, yeah. we don't like, there's no reason for white people, for instance, to know how deeply painful the word colored is like, what's the difference between saying a person of color and a colored person? Yeah. To us. Uh, it's no difference. Like you just moved the words around, but colored is so tied to some of the most painful and legal segregation and vile atrocities. And people were killed because they were deemed colored. colored. And what does that mean? If something is colored and it's bad, well then uncolored must be good. So the embedded racism inside of it is what we miss because all we see is on the surface. It's just a word, but we don't understand the roots of those words. We don't understand. Like one of the things that I learned recently is how sacred a black woman's hair is. We don't have any reason to know that unless we learn that. And I just learned that, like just recently I learned that. But if a white woman's hair or a white man's hair is not sacred to us, it doesn't have a, a certain meaning to us, then if we see hair that we think is kind of cool, we might reach out and touch it. It's one of the most violating things we can do. But we don't know that until we know that. So there's this, I, I call it, Oh, I forget what I call it. <laughs> it, it it's, it, it's like, okay, ignorance, you know, it, it's, it's just, it, it's programmed ignorance that that's okay until we learn and then it's not okay. Right. Yeah, it's, per it's permissible. Yeah. So when we learn things like we're talking about that we didn't know was racist, that's okay. And when Lisa and I facilitate what we call courageous cultural conversations, one of the things that we do, being a white man, me, and a black woman, her, one of the things we do is speak to exactly what you said. I basically say, listen, white people, we're going to say some stuff wrong. We're going to say some things. I, I, I literally just saying that, Jen, and this is totally hypothetical. I just felt my body react to that. When I said, we're going to say some stuff wrong, my body was like, no, then shut up. Like I, I genuinely just felt my body respond to that, but we have to like pre forgive ourselves. We're going to say some things wrong. Our ignorance is going to be exposed and we have to be okay with that. What Lisa generally says right after that, speaking to the black community is we will not make willing white people wrong for their ignorance. And that has Again, been so that. huge. We will not make white willing people wrong for their ignorance. Because to your point, a lot of white people are afraid of the conversation because if our ignorance is, is exposed or if our racist programming is exposed, we yeah. get attacked for it. Yeah, I got you. I got and we you. don't want to get attacked. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are certain voices that have to come from a black mouth or, or certain voices that have to come from a white mouth or certain statements and concepts rather. So it, it has been some of the most profound, cause you know what it is? It's neutralizing. It's your word. And it's been some of the most profound experiences when I see people like Lisa will say that and the black people just go, whoa, because I never knew white people are afraid of their ignorance being exposed. And so we actually have people essentially promise, I will show up with my ignorance as long as I'm not made wrong for it, both ways. And there is so much about the white culture that black people have no idea about. And there's so much about the black culture that white people have no idea about. Right. There's no way for us to know, because as you said, it's literally impossible to know what it's like to live life anything other than 
how we've lived it. So if we can neutralize and if we can really truly embrace that somebody else just simply has a different perspective than me, and then it won't be arguing over, you know, who's right and who's wrong. But I've been greatly encouraged by some of these conversations. You know, we've done this with hundreds of people before on Zoom and we break them up into breakout rooms. We haven't done it live yet because this has all happened during the pandemic. But to have people get neutralized and then we create this safe space, some of the things that come out are, are like beyond words, truly beyond words. And, and what it is is humans seeing humans and not us versus them. No, that's right why versus these conversations wrong. are so important. That's why when you can come with a place of just a softening, a curiosity, a neutrality, and yeah. just listen deeply and hear another person's lived experience, they don't have to lecture to you necessarily. They don't have to educate you. And it's not their job. One of my one of my friends, when I began this journey of trying to understand this, she goes, don't you call that black woman you know and ask her to educate you. That's not her damn job. Right. And I was like, oh, I've heard what? That. <laughs> like, I thought that was so enlightened that I would call her and go, oh, I didn't know this for you, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, don't you do that. That's that. But, but I mean, that makes sense to us, to right? Learn, right? It makes sense to us. So I've done yeah. that plenty of times yeah. where I said, okay, I don't know about something. How do you want me to respond? What do you want yeah. me to do? And I got that same response. Yeah. It's like, that's one of those, those just programmings. Like to us, it makes sense. We're ignorant about something. And if we're willing to be educated, then who should we go to? Right. Find a black person that can educate us about their black experience. But what we don't understand is we're asking them to re-traumatize themselves right. for our benefit. Right. That's what I never got. That's what I didn't get either. But these conversations, so to your point with the conversations you and Lisa host, the, the conversations can do some of that work just by sharing. I, I believe in the power of story. I say this all the time. I believe people want to be seen, heard, known, valued. Absolutely. And that our collective language is story. And we, when we can share each other's stories and listen deeply to another person's story, that is cathartic to them and to us because we learn something, they feel seen, heard, known, valued. That's Absolutely. the power of story right there. And so that's perhaps the answer. Uh, well, there are many answers, but perhaps that's one of the answers is the neutrality of just getting together in a conversation, showing a lot of grace to one another and sharing our lived experience. It's everything. And it, it, it we got to show up to learn. And I think that's part of the neutrality and part of what we say. And I'd, I'd love to share a story from the making of the movie. Please. There's a scene in the movie, if you remember, because you, you saw it, where Lisa is on her own and she's surrounded by a, a picket scene, like a riot scene. You know, there are a lot of picket signs in the background and so forth. And she's talking about her pain as a black woman in America, she's touching her pain and talking about the pain that she's inherited from her ancestors. And she makes a comment. She says, I smile when you walk past to protect what you can handle. But at night I cry their tears. And it's such a powerful statement but something I never knew. And so when we were on set, Lisa tapped into this ancestral pain that Jen was, I mean, I was in tears because I didn't know. To your point earlier, we can't actually know what embedded ancestral trauma is. We can't know that. Now, that doesn't take away anything that we individually have experienced, but it's not at the hands of racism. It's not at the hands of slavery. It, you know, we've never been 
identified as vermin because we have white skin or as animals. Like we've never experienced that kind of systemic invalidation and hatred and violence. So Lisa touched this pain. She ended up filming this scene three times. The first time she touched the pain so deeply, none of the footage was usable. Because we couldn't make out her words. You know, when, when we get to that point where we're gripped by the emotion so much, obviously we don't, you know, we don't speak clearly. And so she was, she was pulled in so deep and she had no idea she was going to go there. But once it grabbed her, it grabbed her and it pulled her down. And then she recovered a little bit, you know, cried, cried some, some ancestors tears and then did it another time and then did it a third time. So what made it into the movie was a combination of takes two and three. What she told me afterwards, oh, I just feel so many goosebumps right now. This is such a pivotal moment for me. She told me afterwards, I've never let a white person see that. Like I'm, I'm crying now. Think like she's never allowed a white person to see her pain, not that pain, because she was taught it's not safe. That's an experience I can't know. You can't know that. Not for the same reasons at the same depth. So we have to come into these conversations being willing to learn things that we literally could never even contemplate on our own. And with that kind of mentality, and I don't know if it's as much of a, a, a if it's a mindset as much of it as a heart set, you know, we got to show up spiritually neutral and emotionally neutral so that I can experience the pain in this black woman that I would have never known. And there's so much beauty in sharing the human experience. But why would we, unless we intentionally lean in? Like there's just, there's no reason to do that. The story that I was gonna tell you earlier, I facilitated a conversation on racism at one of my events a long time ago. There was about 20 of us and there were, I think, three black people and the majority of the room were white women primarily. It just happened to be the makeup of that particular event that had nothing to do with racism. This was just an optional conversation. For the first three hours, it felt like we got nowhere. People were yelling at each other and like these are these are close friends mm. outside of this conversation i mean these are these are people that are staying in each other's rooms and and like have a deep connection but we also don't know because we haven't been taught nor has it been necessary i think to have the deep real courageous conversation so i have a lot of black friends and what's been exposed, what they've shared with me is they actually didn't know that they don't trust me until we started talking about racism. And that was a massive realization for them because they know me in certain ways. We're really tight, but we, I mean, how many, how often do we just sit around and talk about racism? So what I've heard from the black community is there's an ignorance just in the sense of not knowing, not people being stupid, there's, there's simply an ignorance. They have said, two, two men in particular, they both told me they didn't realize that they didn't trust me because we had never been in a conversation where trust was required. Oh. Right? Yeah. 
And then they said, but once George Floyd fractured the world, all their embedded fears that they didn't even know about came to the surface. And some of it was anger. These two particular men are, are, are just like really what I would call gentle, beautiful, sweet men, you know, and, and they had anger they, they shared that they didn't feel comfortable about. They didn't understand, like didn't even know they had it and didn't know that somebody who was otherwise their friend, me, would actually trigger that. And Lisa and I had conversations that were, that were, were pretty, pretty explosive because we never had to have those before. So for the first three hours of this conversation, it didn't feel like we got anywhere because everybody was just kind of at each other's throat. And then at about three hours in, there was a black woman that was talking and she started to share her pain. And when she shared her pain as a black woman, as a human woman, as a mother, regardless of age, race, anything else, as a wife, when she started to share her human pain that have black details attached to it, it was so profound how the entire room came together. And then for the next three hours, we ended up talking about this for like six hours. For the next three hours, what we experienced is what you and I have been talking about. We've ex we experienced about 20 humans sharing the human story from different perspectives rather than arguing over who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad, what exists, what doesn't exist. You know, I've never put this together till right now as I'm telling the story. This is an example of we can't get to reconciliation until we go through the messy stuff. Like we had to go through three hours of messy stuff and thankfully, we had enough time and enough people that were willing to lean in to get to that point. Because how many times would those conversations end at two and a half hours? And now we just go to our corners and we haven't gotten closer to each other. We've just cemented our differences, right? But there was a breaking point where we, we did see each other in each other. And so I've experienced the possibility of this. And three hours, especially on social media or somewhere that has a lot of people like that might be three years, you know, or if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, three hours might be 15 minutes, but there's a, there's a, a phase in this conversation that requires messy and scary and ignorant and emotional. It requires that, but what's on the other side of that, if we're willing to get through the messy is truly beautiful. And I'm getting so many goosebumps just thinking about the shift in the energy of that room. And, and I can only describe it as magical, but it showed me the power of human connection well, and, and neutrality. Well, and that pain is a galvanizer. Pain yes. is a shared human experience. And so that's something we can see and recognize perhaps in each other. And so that's what makes that possible. But we all are so pain adverse and we want to protect from pain. We want to protect from causing pain. We don't want to feel pain. Right. I mean, that's primal yeah. in nature. Absolutely. But you have to allow for the pain to get to the productive point that you're talking about. I, excuse me. I 100% agree. I, um, I've been saying this for a few years now. I haven't, I haven't fulfilled this idea that I'm about to share, but you know, we have this, this word namaste, yeah. the light in me sees the light in you. I really truly believe, and I want to come up with a word that means the pain in me sees the pain in you. Because if we, 
were open to it and we connected from our pain because there's such a shared experience in that and there's such a vulnerability in that it actually does have the power to pull us together but without seeing each other's pain i don't know that we can because you can't have compassion until you have connection and you're probably not going to have connection until you see pain so one of the things that we try to try to do is we either try to be compassionate or we demand other people be compassionate for us but compassion is a byproduct of all the things we've been talking about you can't just flip the switch of compassion right and hold on to all of our biases and go okay i'm just going to be compassionate but even if you don't actively do anything to the judgments and the prejudices and stuff like that but we see the pain in each other the effect of that will be compassion and then we can have a productive discussion so i'm hopeful i like i know it can happen i i'm not i'm not hopeful in the way our communities communicate in the in the atmosphere of especially social media and online I, I don't know the practicality of this but I know if we could get people in a room and see each other in our eyes like look look each other in our eyes we could we could close just about every divide at the very least we're not going to make people agree with each other and we might not make people fall in love with each other but we can actually create human connection but there's so much keyboard courage out there and people that are raged you know behind the computer screen and there's everything but compassion when it comes to all this stuff online so i'm i'm hopeful in the possibility i'm not as hopeful in the practicality at least on a grand scale but i have to pay more attention to the possibility than the practicality otherwise i'll just be depressed all day long that yeah, we just quit trying yeah yeah oh my friend i we could talk over and over and i want I know, you right? back here and we're going to continue to have conversations because there's so much to flesh out um uh, friends i hope that you want to flesh this out along with us would you please you know i say this every time difficult questions and comments and that fleshing out and that pain is welcome here and my instagram is being real jen sean's is coach sean smith that that's where he's at dialogue with us join this conversation oh, i would love and, it and continue it yeah because I, I really want to be part of one of your cultural conversations. I, I can't think of anything more important. I, I, I really can't to engage in, to make, to create um, normalcy around that we need to normalize these conversations that can be difficult and painful. We need to normalize them for our kids. We need to normalize so them true. with each other, right? And so I, I we're, I we're just, just taught to not talk about it, right? We're taught to not don't talk about sex, don't talk about yep. religion, don't talk yep. about politics. Yep. And and so then we're afraid of the discussions. Yep. And then we have meltdowns for all the reasons that we talked about because we have legitimate fears. And so then the only thing we can do is try to avoid the landmines. But what if we actually taught each other how to have courageous conversations? It, it would be amazing, you know, what, what that would do to our, to our world, you know, to our families. There's a lot of families right now that are split in two, yes. whether it's over politics or religion or racism or whatever it is. And it's because they don't know how to talk to each other. And that's sad. So I love the way that you said that. Let's normalize difficult conversations and actually teach each other how to have compassionate conversations rather than avoid them. Well, and that's why we keep doing the work we do, my friend, that that's, that's why, because, and, and this is the thing too, and I'll wrap up with this is that we have to learn. I'm no authority on this. I'm learning in real time, right before your very eyes. And I may stumble through it and I may screw up. And I've just told my audience, just please expect that. And just know I'm not going to get it right, but I'll at least have these conversations in a public forum to invite others to do the same 
And so that's why yeah. we do what we do is to normalize it and to invite others and make it less scary. And y'all, that's what I, I hope you're doing and will continue to do. Um, in I really honor you taking this stance. Mm. You know, when you told me about the podcast, the very first time we talked, I was really taken aback because most people don't have the courage to lean in to their ignorance and to put on display our mistakes and all the things that are required in this conversation. But, you know, most people have agendas or, or we want to defend ourselves and we don't want to open ourselves up to these perceived attacks. But to the point that we were just making, like, this is what's necessary. So I really honor you for taking that stand in this way and specifically with this podcast and it being all about realness. And so I just want to uh, co-sign on the invitation for any of you that want to continue the conversation or, you know, let me know or let Jen know, like, you know what, you guys are talking about racism, but what you said was racist. Like, call us out on something because Please. we genuinely, you know, we can only know when we learn. And so there's no doubt that we probably used unconsciously racist conversations throughout this podcast. Yeah. You know, and the only way to get those exposed is to get those exposed. So please. And if you disagree with something, let us know, uh, whatever it is, you know, lean into these conversations, especially if there's resistance, those are the, the, the juiciest ones. And before we go, Jen, can I just please. tell a super quick story about oh. today about this date? Yes, I was just about to ask you to talk about that. So let's do this. Let's record another episode. You all deserve to hear this story. It is a not to miss, and I want to give it the time it deserves. So for now, please listen for real. Speak up. It matters. Have the hard conversations and join us for this next episode. You got to hear Sean's story. Listen for Real is produced in Rockland, California, and is edited and mixed with the help of Marky B. Our music, entitled Zero, is created and performed by the amazing Shannon Curtis. Please subscribe, rate, and review, and we will see you next time.